Well, let's take our Bibles and turn back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I would ask you to uh, remember uh, me in prayer. I know uh, I want to invite any of you that are watching still and uh, any of you that have not joined us to join us on our Zoom Bible study this last week. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Bill preached for uh, Brother Norm Wells via Zoom there because of COVID and uh, the state of Oregon being such a lockdown type state. They've been having the weather too because it's, it's winter time there and get a lot of snow. They've been having just Zoom uh, worship services and uh, Bill preached for him this last Wednesday night and uh, Brother Norm has asked me to preach for him. Uh, two weeks from now, so hopefully if everything works well, I'll be preaching to the brethren. I asked Bill how it went, and uh, he said Robert joined him on Zoom. You know, Robert was there, but he said he preached to about 23 folks on Zoom, you know, and I said, how did it work? I said, what did you do? He said, I, he said, I sat there in my chair with my notes and my Bible, and he said, well, we all talked and chatted, and uh, they they had, I don't know exactly how, but he said when it got to the point that it was time to preach, that everybody uh, muted, and he said, I preached for about 30 minutes, and I said, well, I hope they can stand more than 30 minutes, because it's hard for me to, to, <laughs> to speak 30 minutes, I can't do it, it's not in my DNA, I don't get, I got too much to say, I think that's what it is, I just got too dadgum much to say, so. but uh, be in prayer for me, I, I look forward to that. Uh, I, I look forward to any opportunity to preach the gospel, especially uh, when the Lord opens a, a door of opportunity like that. And I'd, uh, I'd never uh, say no. Uh, Norm said that the folks he wanted the folks there to meet me, and uh, cause I, I, this would be about the only way I'm I'll ever be able to get up there because at some point in time I feel like they're gonna make it where you got to have a vaccine to get on a plane and your pastor ain't getting vaccinated so I'm just stranded in you're stuck with me here in Ruston Louisiana because I'm just not going anyway I'm going to stay right here and we'll use the means that God has given us so uh th this lesson's entitled the entitled the sanctuary and the services part two part two you know I I, I do want to go back and and, and bring a couple of things back out. Look back over uh, at chapter 8, verse 13. Paul told these believers, and that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first covenant old. Now, that which decayeth and waxeth old. Now, think about the language he uses here. We're talking about Everything involved in that whole mosaic economy. We're talking about the entirety of the law of God, which included not only the, the Ten Commandments, but the 635 ceremonial commandments. And we, we got to keep these things together now. When we think of the mosaic economy, the mosaic covenant, as it relates to national Israel, it involves everything in that tabernacle and then later the temple all the sacrifices all the holy days all of it pertained to national Israel it was given by a holy eternal everlasting merciful and gracious God to this particular people for this particular time to the appointed time to keep them together as a nation to bring the Lord Jesus Christ through it. I, I thought about it this week in preparing for this, me this series of messages that I'm going to begin to preach this morning. You know, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Have you ever thought about it like this? Was Adam a Jew? Let me ask you this. We'll go, we'll go into more modern time. Was Abraham a Jew? A national Jew? What was he? He was a Gentile. Right? And when we think about it, the, the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish state, wasn't born to two generations later. Yet Abraham, what did he do? He believed God has imputed to him for righteousness. So 
when we, when we talk about salvation, eternal life, it's got nothing to do with na- nations or regions or individual uh, uh, nationalities of people. It has to do with God's people, right? His chosen seed. Those that he determined before the foundation of the world to say, and we know that to be the case because, listen, this covenant that God established, God established this covenant. And he refers to it in this way. Now that which decayeth. Huh? Something given by God, instituted to typify and foreshadow the Lord Jesus Christ, to hold forth Christ's person and his work, all that he is, all that he do, all that he accomplished, fulfilling all the promises. God says all those types and shadows, everything involved in that whole economy, what's happening to it? It's decaying. Uh, the one whom it typified, what about him? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he refers to this old covenant, something that could decay and something that could wax old and also something that is ready to vanish, to go away, to be of no use. Why? We have the fulfillment. Remember old Simeon? He had been given a promise by God that he would not die till he had seen the consolation of Israel, the deliverance of Israel. And they bring that baby in at the appointed time, and he holds that child in his arms. And he says, Lord, let thy servant go in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And the next thing he says about that salvation he had saw, he said, the consolation of your people Israel, a light, listen to this, a light to lighten the Gentiles. So it, it, even though it, in, in reality it was complete when Christ cried, it's finished, the, the entirety of that covenant, that, that mosaic economy, didn't vanish away till when? 70 A.D., when according to God's promise, Titus <laughs> came into Israel and did exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ had told those women that were crying for him as they went out to crucify him, that not one stone will be left upon another. Now think about what that meant to a Jew. Think of the value that they put in that tabernacle, that temple. Huh? They, they, they looked at that and all those ceremonies. You know, the, and and, and we've got to make the distinction in our mind here. David wasn't looking at that tabernacle or that temple and those sacrifices and that Ark of the Covenant as his salvation. What was he looking at? He was looking at Christ. Korah. What was he looking for for salvation? The types, his performance, his duties. So all those, even though it, even even the elect of God in national Israel, they went through all those rituals. They were required under that mosaic economy as a people to participate in every exercise in that ceremony. Right? Didn't save them, didn't qualify them, didn't make them more saved, didn't make them more acceptable, didn't do anything as far as their eternal salvation. It was obedience to God's revealed will by way of commandment. Keep this covenant. And so they looked at those things, and when sacrifices were made, they, by God-given faith, the same faith that you and I have, the faith of God's elect, what did they do? They saw the person and work of the promised Messiah. But their Jewish... Physical brethren that stood beside them that the Lord had not given eyes to see, ears to hear, heart, mind, and will to comprehend the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. They looked at those things and thought, i got to do this, and if I don't do this, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to die eternally. And so it was all conditioned on them. God says, this is this that you've put all your stock in, you've put your hope in, you, you've trusted your salvation to, what's happening? It's vanishing away. And I, tell, I, I don't believe they believed it. 
I really think national Israel, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees and the, 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 the high priest in national Israel, I don't think they thought there was ever going to come a time that everything that they valued and held so near and dear was going to go away. But I'll be dead gum it did. So to lose everything, and they're being told by these folks now, these, these true believers are being told, you ain't got these things. We have everything and more. <laughs> we have all we need, right? Because, listen, we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, not now, not ever. And I tell you what, every time you or I put confidence in the flesh, it's to our detriment. No, it is. And see, the apostle mentions here, what, the, the way he uses this language, he's showing them that everything you see here, just like his Lord had said, our Lord had said, is temporary. There's no eternal value to any of this. The only thing that's eternal is what? The Word of God. The eternal Word. The incarnate Word. And so he began, and we saw a couple weeks ago, he begins describing all these things that were placed and ordered and ordained by God and placed into this tabernacle. In verses 1 through 4, where we read a couple weeks ago, this, you know, for verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made. The first was you know, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that's the outer court, the inner court, the holiest of all, where the Ark of the Covenant, which is about what we're fixing to get to, which held, now notice what he said, which held, had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant laid round about, round about with gold. That, all, that golden censer was the where they burned the incense and they took the incense from the the burning coals from off of the brazen altar outside where they had made the sacrifices, they placed it into the incense, which that's the sacrifice of Christ, his shed blood, his accomplished work of redemption. They put it in the incense, in the incense and it began to burn, and it was Christ's efficacy as the eternal sacrifice that gave intercession, the intercessory work of his prayers. That's what that golden censer, you know, because before he went in, that smoke filled this holy of holies where he went into. But now he says that, that the, the ark, uh, here, here's where we want to look at, and the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant. Overlaid round about with gold. In other words, what, what, what do we see here? This, this little small box, and it's not a big thing. I'm, I don't remember the dimensions of it. If somebody knows them, shout them out. I don't know, but it wasn't a big thing. But I tell you what, God, had, you, you think about it. God gave certain men skill to be able to build this thing. They, they didn't have the kind of die and tool equipment that, Ray, that you've got to make tires. <laughs> They didn't have power equipment like we've got. They didn't have the, the, the kiln facilities that you and I have in our generation. I, I, I was always loved to watch the uh, Smithsonian ch Channel, and I was watching the one uh, when Catherine was here this last weekend. We watched the one about Virginia, and they went to, uh, they showed this place, and it's a, it's a replica of old. Uh, the way the way things were back at the beginning when the when the settlers first came here, and I went there in, in 1972 and toured this. Uh, it's called Williamsburg, I think, is what the name of it is. But I went there, and it was one of the first times I ever saw them people in there. You know, they're dressed in all these old garb, like they were dressed back in the 16, 1700s before the uh, Revolutionary War, and. And they, they, these people live there in that city. The homes are built the same. They're buggies and carriages, you know, no, everything. And that's what their job is. They work there every day. They get up, and it's where you visit it and go inside and see all these things. They had a one that they were blowing glass, and that was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, where they had that glass on that 
tube, you know, blowing that thing and spinning it. They didn't have all of this back then. But God gifted these men to be able to take gold and overlay this box and be able to build these cherubims that we're going to see in a few minutes and build all of it perfectly and completely just like God declared, de- demanded that they, do, that they do. Gave them instructions to do. And they covered it in, they covered it on the inside and they covered it on the outside. Why? What's that ark represent? It's Christ. And gold, when you think about it, what is it? How do, how do you get gold pure? Huh? Heat it up. Burn it. Put it in a fire. Turn it into liquid. And what happens? The impurities come to the top. Take it off. This, this was pure gold. Overlaid on the outside. Overlaid on the inside. What does that tell us of the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember what he said to Mary? That holy thing. Holy inside, holy outside. And when you think about it, folks, when you think about the tabernacle, we're talking about the tabernacle, we're not talking about the temple, because the temple was something glorious. Now, it really was. The tabernacle was a tent covered with skins. And from all the sacrificing they did, covered with blood. You ever been around, I, I, I'm not much of a hunter, but I, I, I bet Ray and Bart know something about this. You know, you, you kill a bunch of animals, what, what shows up? Flies do. Yeah. And so here, here we have this, this thing on the out, doesn't, it doesn't look like anything that, that would be like, that's where the glory of God dwells. But our Lord Jesus Christ, how did he appear? To those that were that. Nobody desired him. They didn't see the glory of God in him. They looked at him and said. Is not this Jesus. The son of Joseph. Of Nazareth. The carpenter's son. Who was he? He was the glory of God incarnate. He was Emmanuel. Dwelling among them. And they couldn't see. He came into his own what? Don't receive him not. They didn't see him. He said, we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So you look at the outside of the tabernacle, and you, the, the common Jewish person couldn't go inside even into the, into the first part of the tabernacle, much less the second part. The only one that could go in there was the high priest, and that only one time a year, and that not without blood. So they, didn't, they couldn't go into there. They didn't know what it looked like, but the high priest and the priest that served in the tabernacle, they saw it all the time, what was going on out in that the part where the showbread, because they had to renew the showbread. They had to keep the incense burning. They had to keep the candelabra lit. They had to do that all the time. They had the sacrifices you know, through the day. The annual sacrifices, the sacrifices at the, at the particular dates, the three times a year. But sitting in the middle of that Holy of Holies was the most glorious piece of the whole tabernacle. And this 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 ark, now when you think about it, the whole cut tabernacle, what was it built for? What was it built for? To house the ark. To put the ark of the covenant in. Why? God had told Moses, where am I going to meet you at? At the mercy seat. Where does God meet me and you as sinners at? He meets us at the mercy seat, which is Christ our Lord. And this this ark and the law it contained, when we think about it, was the greatest Old Testament representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, why do you say that, Richard? Because of this. He's the true ark. Wherein the law was magnified and honored. Listen to you. Paul wrote to those at Rome, you and me included. He says, For what the law could not do. And by the law, what are we talking about? Everything in that whole economy. 
We've already, we, what we're going to look at it is we get up in, in this, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin. What the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. What did he send him in the likeness of sinful flesh? And he sent him here for sin. And what did he do? He condemned sin. He put away sin where? In the flesh. As our substitute and surety. Paul said also in Romans chapter 10 verse 4. Christ is the end. Romans 10 4. Christ is the end. He is the completion. He is the fulfillment. He's the end of the law for every man that believes. You think about it. Christ was the ark in whom the law was satisfied. And he's the mercy seat by which atonement or reconciliation was made with respect to the curse of the law. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world for one reason alone. (laughs) To save his people from their sins. And in that closed ark, now think about this, there was nothing, and I, you know, I need to correct myself because I've made some statements in the past. They were, not, they were not malicious, but they were not completely accurate. I'm going to show them to you right now. Because I used to always say, what was in the ark? What did you think was in the ark? I used to think there was two tables of stones in there, and there were two tables of stones. The first table with five and the other table, right? They were in it. The broken law wasn't in there. What? Just the tables of law. When God rewrote it and gave the law, those were in there. But this is what else I used to say was in there. You know what I said was in there? That golden censer, now that golden pot with the manna. And I don't know how I got to this point other than just following what other men said. I said also was in that ark. You know what else I used to think was in that ark? Aaron's rod that budded. Folks, we're talking about a box 24 inches long. 18 inches wide, 18 inches deep. We're talking about a man unless he was a midget. They had a broke off piece of the the rod in there. But I discovered something in studying for this. And we need to be clear on this. In that closed ark, you know what? There was nothing there but the two tables of stone. Period. But here's the thing you got to remember. At each end of that ark of the covenant that contained those two tables of the law and joined to it, sitting right alongside of it, you know what was there? The manna. And what else? That rod that budded. Write these verses down. I don't have time to look at all of these, but write down Deuteronomy 31, 26, 1 Kings 8, 9, 2 Chronicles 5, 10. That's three different times that God said there are to be only the two tables in the ark. Deuteronomy 31, 26. 1 Kings 8, 9, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 10. But here's the thing. That, 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 so, in, in other words, that miracle working rod and that Hannah, they were, they were joined to it. They went together because all these things, what do they typify? Christ said of the manna, what is, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and what happened to them? They died. He said, I'm the bread of life. Any man eats of this bread, how long is he going to live? He's going to live forever. How long could the manna stay good? One day. Two days, what happened to it? It it was rancid with with worms. Huh? But yet, miraculously, this golden pot with that manna that's joined to the Ark of the Covenant, the manna never went bad. (laughs) You say, that's impossible. No, I'm I'm telling you what, it is possible. Listen to this. In Exodus 16, 
verse 32 and 33. Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the, the bread wherewith I fed them in the wilderness when I brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. In other words, the bread that I, that I give, it never goes bad. Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it before the Lord. Uh, how's it going to be laid before the Lord? It's put where? Because where's the Lord at? He dwelt between the cherubs over the mercy seat. Put it before the Lord. And listen to this one concerning that bud. That, that rod that budded in Numbers chapter Numbers chapter 17 concerning Aaron's rod that budded. Basically says the same thing. Verse 10. And the Lord, Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a... Where's it at? It's before the testimony. What's the testimony? It's the ark. That's the testimony. That's God's witness. To be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. And Moses did so as the Lord commanded him, so did he. You know what else? I, I discovered something this week. You know that when Moses smote the rock, you know which rod he used to do it? This one that budded. <laughs> it budded. Even the Lord Jesus Christ. And now turn back over our text. Notice what he says. He says, inside this ark of the covenant are the tables of the covenant. What's there? The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. The whole tabernacle, with every piece of its furniture, all of which typified the Lord Jesus Christ, was made and appointed to minister to the ark. And when the ark was removed, those things stood idle and had no use. And see, you think about it. what that teaches us is all that reveals to you and me is that the very heart and foundation of the Christ whole work of mediation consisted in what? In his satisfying the demands of God's law and justice as our representative. And to see, this reveals God's redemptive character, his glory as a just God and a Savior. How? Because redemption rested God. God's acceptance of Israel as a nation and God's acceptance of all true Israel rests in one thing. What? Christ Jesus our Lord. So think about it. Christ's mission to satisfy and magnify, and I want to get this right, so I might even just read it because I don't want to make a mistake on this because this is so important that we understand these things. Christ's mission was to satisfy and magnify God's law by the establishment of a perfect righteousness which is imputed to all who will ever be saved. All of them. And we have to understand, again, that that whole old covenant, all of it, and this is what I want you to get this morning, was peculiar to who? National Israel. That's all. It typified and it prefigured a much greater glory but in itself, everything involved in that mosaic economy, it belonged to who? Huh? Who did it belong to? Who did it, who, who did it have influence over? Who was directed to obey and honor every, every demand of it, command it? Israel, the nation Israel. The Ten Commandments written on tables of stone and deposited in an ark, they held the supreme place in that covenant, revealing the utmost esteem God has for his law. And here's the thing that national Israel missed that God's children don't miss. 
There's no salvation apart from what? Satisfaction. They thought there was. There can be no salvation apart from perfect satisfaction. But still, that law, as it was given unto the people, it, it was abolished and done away when the temple and the Ark of the Covenant was done away. And actually, we see it happen many times during national Israel's flight until they got to Jerusalem and built the temple. How many times did they lose the Ark? Huh? It was taken away by their enemies. And what happened to them? They were without guidance. They were without direction. They were people lost in their own way. Why? They didn't have the written law of God any more. Well, here's the difference. In the gospel economy as opposed to the mosaic economy, where's God write his law? Not on tables of stone. It's written, we say our heart, but the heart means what? He writes it in our understanding, in our mind. You say, oh, Lord, we're fixed to become law keepers. No, hold on now, we're not. I promise you we're not going to be law keeper. But he writes his law in our hearts. And think about it, that, that law that he writes in our heart, it includes all those perfections of morality and worship that pertain to both Jew and Gentile summarized by our Lord Jesus Christ when he told us what are we to do. We are to love God supremely and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're to worship God how? In spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in in human flesh, as opposed to all those old carnal, earthly ordinances that were a, a he says it in verse 9 of our text. I'm getting the wrong book. In verse 9 he says, which was a figure for the time present in which offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make the him that did the surface, here's perfect, as pertaining to where? The conscience. You see that? I'm telling you, you can't admit, now this is so important, you cannot worship a God that you're at enmity against, that you think is not reconciled to you. you listen, would, would you, would, I, I think about uh, it just popped into my head. I think about Jacob. Remember Jacob? Remember when he went out to meet Esau? Huh? He was God's chosen seed, Jacob. When he went out to meet Esau, what was he? He was scared to death. And what did he do? He offered gifts to his brother because he thought, I got to do something to make this, make this man happy with me. He was scared he's going to kill him the same way with Joseph's brethren. Remember when he revealed himself to them and later on when the father had died, Jacob had died, what did they think? Oh, Lord, it's coming now. He's fixed to pay us back for all that we did. And what did he say? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't. You meant it for evil. But what did God do? He meant it, meant it for good. And see, here, here's the thing we've got to remember. This law written on our hearts, it doesn't mean that God's will comes naturally to the child of God. I've heard religious people, especially a bunch of Reformed people, say, well, we serve God willingly and with great joy. That's just not true. That's not, that's not being honest with yourself, and it's not being honest with what the Scriptures tell us. I, keep, keep, to honor God in our obedience, it doesn't come naturally, apart from the means of God's testimony. His revealed will by way of commandment. But what it does mean is this, that you and me as God's children, we see the law having been completely fulfilled where? In Christ. That's, that's impossible for the natural man to rest in. Huh? Think about your own life. I'm not going to ask you to confess it. Any of you sinned this week. You know your heart, and I know mine. Anybody here love God perfectly this week with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, every moment of the day, 24 hours a day? Anybody here done that? 
if you if you have, you might want to leave at this present time because you, I'm telling you, you hadn't heard anything now. How many of us have loved our neighbors ourselves? How many of us, how many of you this week, myself included, have fretted about what's going on in our country and this globe with everything we've seen, worried to death about everything that's coming our way? Yeah, and it, it's just in us by nature. I was sitting there last night right before I went to bed looking at something, and I saw a thing come across my phone that said that there's that all the producers are saying we're fixing to experience a shortage of meat, potatoes, and, and eggs. Did you try to go to the grocery store yesterday? Remember what happened when they told us we was going to have a shortage on toilet paper? Paper towels? Huh? What people do? What we do? And I read that, and, I, and my, I almost got up and put my clothes on back on Bart, went to the grocery store last night, buy some eggs and some meat and some potatoes. What is that? That's fear. Folks, I mean, our God's in control. Nothing happens by chance. Everything happens on purpose, all of it. So we're to strive to obey God and we're to avoid sin not to save us or keep ourselves saved or even to recommend ourselves unto God, but we're to obey God and seek to honor him in every area of our lives out of a spirit of love to him who loved us and gave himself for us and is adopted sons and daughters of God. We are his children. Don't forget that. You say, well, Brother Richard, you don't know the thoughts that I thought this week. Oh, you'd be surprised. I'm not saying that lightly. I know people say, I don't like to think about my pastor doing that. I'm telling you, any man that would stand up in a pulpit and tell you he is new and improved is a liar. I think one of the things that stuck in my mind, I think I've shared this with you before, but I'll share it again and we'll quit right here this morning. I'll never forget I told Henry one time, I said, Henry, does it ever get any easier? Henry was 62, Bart, and I was 27. This is from a man I heard the gospel from who I know brought the gospel to us, that the Lord used to bring the gospel to us. And I told him, I said, does it ever get any easier? And he said, Richard, I'm 62 years old. And he said, it's worse now them when I was your age and I was like couldn't you just kept that to yourself and I, you know what it proved out to be true you'd think the way religion teaches us is that we go along through this trail that all these things would get easier I tell you it's harder I see sin in everything that I do. When I, I swear when I'm out there walking down that path and I'm spending time in prayer with our Lord, I find myself thinking, Lord, don't kill me for what I've just said. <laughs> don't enter into judgment with me over my prayer. I, sometimes I, I swear we need to just shut up and be quiet. He, listen, before we ever speak, he's answered. Before we ever form, form, form the words in our mouths, what? He's heard. He has. And we need to trust him in it. But all our hope, our, we serve him out of a spirit of adoption and grace. And let me say this. That those Gentiles who were converse, converted, they were convinced to sin. They weren't convinced to sin by the Ten Commandments of Moses. Huh? Hagar. Remember her in the, in, the, in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11? She didn't have the Ten Commandments. The, the Gentiles were never part of the nation of that covenant. How do I know? He, Paul said this, Wherefore remember that you being in times past in, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision... Now, who's calling them this? Not God. He said, you're being called. You were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision. How? 
in the flesh made by hand. So the Jews were saying to the Gentiles, y'all are the uncircumcision, we're the circumcision. The difference was what? They cut it with a knife and the Gentiles had it. We're better than you. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of the promises, having no hope, Without God in the world, yet God saved Hagar. He saved Naaman. He saved the widow of Sarepta. Remember those people? The Gentiles never sought righteousness. They never sought justification. They never sought eternal life by the deeds of the law. But it was the law of natural conscience which witnesses to all that justification and life can only be attained one way. The law was a schoolmaster to drive them to Christ. We have the law written in our conscience. What is it? Is it to drive us to do better? To be new and improved? No, what is to drive us to Christ? That we might be justified by his righteousness Along. We'll stop right there and we'll come back, pick up next week in verse 5. I appreciate your presence. Lord, bless you. You're dismissed.